I think we can start. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, our first keynote speaker, Sean van der Don. Uh, Sean is a professor in <laughs> computer science at the Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium. He's also the head of the Louvain Interaction Laboratory, a lab that conducts research, research development in consulting services in different domains, uh, most related to user interface engineering. Uh, he has over 25 uh, years of experience in research and development during which he has won multiple awards. For instance, the ACM Service Award for contributions to ACM in 2004, 2006, and 2010. Uh, among many of his achievements, uh, he published a book entitled um, Ergonomic Guide uh, of User Interfaces. It's a book in French uh, that took five years to write. And this book is uh, the most cited uh, reference in the world uh, French speaking community for usability guidelines. Uh, he founded uh, the conference series on computer-aided design of user interfaces and task models for user interface design, uh, which later um, which later on gave rise to a new series of, of conference, uh, a new ACM conference on engineering interactive systems uh, in 2009. Currently, uh, he is a tenure hold of the ABN UCL Chair on Strategic Management of Information Systems. Uh, he's also the co editor in chief for the Stringer uh, Human Computer Interaction Series. Uh, he has published widely in topics uh, related to human computer interaction, information systems, and more, most specifically, on user interface design. And in his talk today, uh, John is, will talk about an important topic that uh, is how we can ensure a smooth uh, transition from participatory design to DevOps uh, so that we uh, what we design is what we, um, what we develop. So in short, it's a, it's a great honor uh, to have John van der Dog as a speaker at IESD 2021, and I happily uh, give the floor to John. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me properly? Yes. OK, so thank you very much again, uh, Silvia, for your kind introduction. Uh, buenos dias a todos. ¿Qué tal hoy? Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or maybe good evening for those who are in a different time zone. Um, let me share my screens now. Okay. Uh, can you see my slides? Not, ah, yes, it's coming. So good morning again. Um, in this presentation, I'd like to share with you uh, some of our experience on how to ensure some smooth transition from design operations to development operations. Although you may argue that design is of course, is of course part of the development, design is a key stage uh, in the software development lifecycle. In, in this presentation, I will, of course, focus on my area of expertise, which is user interface development. So I will not talk about uh, other aspects. But maybe we can discuss them uh, afterwards. So I'll start with some definitions and motivations. And my main message, or the, the key message that I would like to convey today, is what I'm calling the seven eyes. And of course, I will. Uh, first, exemplify that on a first case study, which is an application based on gesture. And then a second one with uh, real-time graphical user interface development. And I will then uh, give some other smaller examples of how we tried 
to ensure this transition with the seven eyes and then conclude. So first of all, um, usually I'd like to, to keep in mind that the overall goal of design or development ops is to reduce the time elapsed between a change request and the moment the new delivery is given or shipped while ensuring some software quality. So in, in this definition, I'd like to um, highlight three things. It's just not only the, the uh, in, in this definition, it's not only the time that is important, the delivery, but also why ensure some software quality. So there are many, many definitions of DevOps. I don't know how many, although it has been initiated already some years ago in, in Belgium. Uh, I, I pointed out here a few definitions because there are some key aspects uh, that I would like to ensure. So first, in, in the first definition, which says DevOps is, makes up a model in which development, etc., and maintenance are integrated. So integration, this will be uh, one of my seven eyes and automate it as much as possible, but not everything can be automated, of course. In the second definition, it says that DevOps is any software development method where there is a tight coupling between operation teams and software developers. So this will be also one of my seven eyes later on. A particular instance of that is, of course, a tight collaboration uh, between stakeholders who are involved in the software development lifecycle. And my last but not least point is including you and user themselves as soon as uh, possible. So this is very valid for uh, DevOps. More specifically for uh, design operations, of course, sometimes developers are also designers, or sometimes designers are also developers, although not with the same experience or the same results. Um, design ops means we want to get the best out of the design uh, stage by operationalizing the workflow, managing projects, etc. But most important is always to improve the quality of the designs. Um, so the idea is to get the best of what designers do best. It is, of course, the design. In the second definition from uh, Jacob Nielsen is the orchestration of all of these things. Uh, again, to amplify the design values. And last, it's also referred to the practice of integrating the design team's workflow. So I will illustrate that on two particular workflow in uh, design operations. Uh, a few motivations. Uh, um, again, according to the Aberdeen um, report, the first motivation for introducing DevOps, but also design ops is, again, to reduce development costs. Of course, we are facing technological complexity, but I would like to also consider how to take into account uh, evolving or fast evolving data requirements, which are coming from end users. When uh, an application performance management system uh, is deployed, so it is a system which monitors all activities during the software development lifecycle, many measures can be gathered and there is a significant difference if a team, uh, a project team is using such a software or not. If it is a software, then it is very practical to identify source of delay. Where are the delays and why? So this has the highest impact, contrary to without using uh, this kind of software. And the second, which I like very much, of course, I will address that more explicitly, is how to monitor the user experience. So end user experience is more than just usability. Usability is, of, of course, defined as the efficiency, the effectiveness, and the subjective satisfaction of the end user. But end user also includes some other aspects, like hedonic aspects, pleasure, fun, uh, which are very hard to monitor and to, to measure. Uh, 
Um, in order to sum up the main motivation, of course, DevOps and design ops, they call different aspects from both computer science and management science. I will not, of course, develop management science aspect. But from the computer science aspect, the most important uh, motivation is always to maximize the efficiency of the software development life cycle while ensuring quality factors. And for instance, if I refer to the, the ISO 25010 uh, uh, standard and the, the so called uh, square fact, um, standard, one of those factors is exactly usability, which is further decomposed into some others like user interface um, aesthetics, etc. If I consider the equivalent in management science, management people, they like to quickly respond to end user requests. Uh, for instance, as a regular uh, user of Microsoft Teams, I observed that it took about three months to include the feature raising the hand in Microsoft Teams, a feature which was already in Google Meet beforehand. Maybe the, it took less time, but I observed that for, for me, in my version, it took three months just to introduce that. And of course, to guarantee that these requests were addressed. In the overlapping, then we, we can generalize that, that in general, there is a need to uh, reduce the time to market delivery while ensuring any aspect of software quality. Of course, it's impossible to uh, address them all. So there is a need to prioritize the quality factors that we want to address. In, in this talk, I will, of course, focus on only one of them, which is usability. There are different means to do that. From a computer science point of view, um, of course, agile methods have been there for a while, and I'm sure that Lenbass will, uh, will show the history from the early days to, to today. Again, participatory design techniques have been there for a while, but now there is a need to maximize their impact. On the management size uh, part, there is also a need to have methods in order to quickly adapt the organizational structure of the development team. So that depending on there is a need for more designers or more developers or more participants or less or other people like maybe um, experimenters or evaluators, there is a need to have a flexible structure. In the overlapping, there is a recognized need for improving the flexibility of the organizational structure of the development team and to maximize as much as possible ex the user experience and to have the capability to measure it. Uh, so while measuring this, it is also needed to innovate. So now let me uh, show you what I want to uh, deliver as the main message in, in this talk, which I'm calling the seven eyes. The implementation continuity, how to include end users throughout the software development life cycle, why to put interaction first and development of other aspects afterwards, how to integrate stakeholders, not just end users, but maybe also evaluators, uh, project managers or even marketing people in the software development life cycle. Um, I also promote that the iteration, uh, we always hear that uh, iterative design or iterative development is a must, but I prefer to say that iteration should be short, not necessarily fast, in order to promote incremental progress. And the last is to keep some openness to uh, innovation. So let me start by uh, illustrating those aspects. My, uh, so this, these are the, my seven eyes, my seven favorite eyes. And here they are sorted in decreasing order of importance. But now they are not all equally important. So first of all, I'd like to illustrate what we can do on that with a gesture-based application. So in a gesture-based application, maybe you are familiar with the, the, the surface gesture with your smartphone, and tablet. Uh, for instance, you can pinch in, pinch out for zooming in, zooming out into an image. 
Um, but you can also say check or uh, no, I disagree, or I like, or I dislike. So all of, all of these gestures, uh, whether they are in 2D or 3D, can be mapped to command. So my, my problem here, my design problem is, we have to have gestures, like maybe this one, to be collected from end users, not developers. Huh? I'm a developer and probably I'm the worst person to ask what is my favorite gesture. I can assure you. And so once gestures are collected from end users, real users, how to map them into command in the system itself, which is called the, the mapping. Of course, we have to do that with several uh, people. The problem is that, especially today, our end users cannot be gathered maybe in an afternoon or even in a day in one, in one time slot and in one space. They are always distributed in time and space. So for that, I will illustrate that on a process that is illustrated with this workflow. First, we'll define how to collect those gestures, how to conduct the, the collecting, how to classify their results and to measure their quality, to discuss what we can keep and what we can discard, and then export the result to the next step for developers. And all of these steps can be, of course, recursively uh, performed because they are all always tracked on all steps. So for this purpose, I'd like to um, show you a first demo here. Um, can you st still see? Yes. No. Um, I have to change my screen. Just a minute. Um, So I have to share another screen, which is that one. Okay, I copy paste also the link uh, in the chat room so that you can uh, see them. So in this application, which is called uh, Gesture Manager, we have to create a new gesture set. So in gestures, you can have shapes, letters, A, B, C, D, numbers, zero, one, two, three, or Greek alphabet, alphabet data, but also other things, so like uh, shapes, circles, rectangles. So here we want to create, let's say, a new class of, uh, of gestures, or we may want to, uh, to look for an existing one, like for circles. Of course, it is impossible to draw on my trackpad or even with a mouse, uh, a perfect circle or square. So here you can see some of the uh, some of the squares, which are not really squares, <laughs> but they are input by end users. So as you can see, there are different shapes, different order, different directions, and all of these variations should, should be taken into account. For each sample collected by end users, we have to uh, measure a series of quality measures. So in order to collect these gestures from different people, there is a need to conduct an experiment or a way to create uh, those gestures while people are distributed in time and space. So this is a web applications where here end user have to, uh, they received a link and where they are prompted to uh, create gestures they want. For instance, it could be circle, but it could be anything. So those end users are prompted to say, which gesture would you like to do for these operations? Uh, so a little bit later on. So of course they can create, let's say here, it is just a simple circle. As you can see, the circle is not a real circle, but this is how people uh, create. And all of these samples are properly recorded in the data set, and they will be immediately reused in the development, not just in the design. We can also use many different uh, interaction techniques like a webcam, a pointer, a trackpad, a mouse, or even a pen. So all of these uh, gesture proposal are collected in the systems and handled. Then after that, when all those 
uh, gestures are collected. Here you can see what, what happened for different classes, different experiments. The designer is then at any time able to say, <coughs> here is the, the complete gesture set, <coughs> I'm sorry, that you can check. Or if the designer wants to invite other participants or other stakeholders, this URL automatically leads to the, <coughs> to the experiment in order to collect those gestures. So at any time, the designer can say, OK, I have enough participants. I have enough information. Or I want to invite more. Or I want to share that with developers. Or I want to share that with marketing people or anybody else. So um, when ever, everyone is happy, so there is a discussion uh, forum in order to share the result for that with other people. When there is a consensus, <coughs> all of these gestures which have been collected from real hand users can be then exported into a file that will be immediately reused by developers. So there is no need to reuse or to create yet another a set of gestures and another recognizer or whatever. So this is uh, performed in this way. So it can be exported with all the data, or it could be directly to public to an application or, or whatever, so that here there is a transition from design to development. Everything that has been captured at design time will be reused by developer um, at development time. And of course, you can review uh, so here, it, the designer is reviewing the results of an experiment performed and can be, of course, managed, create, delete, uh, and review the tasks, and so forth. I invite you to look at the full demo. Uh, okay. So now. Maybe I should share the main screen. Okay, so as you, you have seen in this workflow, there are several steps which are defined in a configuration. So it's a pipeline architecture that can be, of course, um, um, stored, managed, and recreated. First, design an experiment and how to invite here the participants. You may invite people from a, a news group for a list or from an, an organization to participate. Then in the next step, any participant, it could be a developer, an end user, a designer, an experimenter, is prompted to create the gestures they want with the very right device and the very right uh, pointer that they are using. So if somebody is using a smartphone, it will be collected as a gesture for a smartphone. If it is for a tablet, or if it is even with a pointer captured by your webcam, this will be recorded in that way. So after that, uh, the system um, supports the designers in performing some classification, what type of gestures. And in the end, several measures are automatically computed in order to help the designer, but also the evaluator to decide this gesture is OK. Like, for instance, as you can see here, there is a very high agreement rate or for this one. But uh, for instance, this one, the agreement rate, which is a measure, is very low. At least it is lower than average. So the designer may decide to say, no, this one, uh, this gesture, I will not use it in, my, uh, in the rest of the development. But this one, maybe yes. And after that, uh, these results can be shared and discussed with the participants. Say, or do you agree with this one? Or do you want to keep it, yes or no? And in the end, the results are exported into a project that can be immediately reused by the developer himself or herself. Now you say, yes, but this, you, you may argue that this is easy for a gesture. But now, if it is for, a, let's say, a real uh, graphical user interface for a website. Can we do the same? More or less, yes. So for in order to initiate here, I would like to illustrate that uh, with the process from uh, a very nice 
uh, environment developed by uh, this company, Teleport HQ. First, we have to initiate to customize how to collaborate. Of course, always measure the results, discuss them in order to decide what to keep and what to discard, and then export the results for the developer. So here is an example you can uh, you can see uh, on online. No. In, in this editor, it's like, it's not just like a traditional web editor. Not only you can uh, create, of course, websites, uh, static one or even dynamic one, but it, it is based on the concept of objects or templates, which are user interface templates. So here, instead of creating uh, new web pages just by uh, things, you can Take, you can decide. So this is an object and it creates a template, like maybe a, this is a card for a city and this is your project. And in the end, you can copy paste anything and then the system recreates the user interface for you. So instead of working at the widget level, let's say you want to drag and drop just one at a time, you create the entire web page at a higher level abstraction than just the widget level. Now, this is nice for uh, creating a website when you know what you, you want to do. But uh, when it is a designer with some experience, no problem. But when it is somebody who wants to create a website with little or no experience, here is a very intelligent feature where the system can be prompted by natural language processing. So instead of creating from scratch, you can say, Okay, teleport this is the name of the system. Please make me a website. Mm. Um. Please create a website with some cards. Then the system automatically recreate a series of layouts that you can pick from the right here. If you add the height and the width, let's say 400 pixels and 1000 for the width, the system recreates dynamically in real time new layouts for you, even layouts which do not exist yet. So instead of creating for you, you can start from those things. And then you can refine that with natural language at any time. So here I can type, or I can, of course, uh, use that with speech recognition. Let's say three images, three headings, and six paragraphs. From this natural language prompt, and everybody can do that, the system recreates, as you can see here, uh, different prompts with, indeed, three images, uh, paragraphs, and buttons. So this is a very nice way to uh, initiate the website design instead of starting from scratch. After that, you can customize and you can invite people to join your project. They can do the same with you. And you can also measure at any time the quality. So here you can probably notice on the left part here, there are some aesthetic metrics. Uh, for instance, in the ISO square standard, one subfactor is about user interface aesthetics. So the systems here automatically compute some aesthetic metrics for you, like balance, alignment, concentricity, um, proportion, regularity, and qualifies that for you. So you have already, even, at, even before deploying, you have an idea on how aesthetic your web page will be. Then you can discuss that with, of course, other stakeholders. And in the end, the system automatically generates XML for you, and you can choose uh, you can choose different exporting code, like in Vue, in Pre-React, like Stencil, or in Angular, or even in, in React Native. So at any time, from the same point of view, the same starting point on the left, which is a user interface description language, 
you can automatically generate code uh, without knowing any line of code. So here, in those two examples, let, now let me dive a little bit more into my seven eyes. And the most important one is the implementation continuity. Um, this concept is not new. It has been already introduced some years ago, uh, especially when there is a concept of continuous delivery. It says that there should no longer be any uh, separation between the design operations and the development. So instead of saying, okay, the design, I'm a designer, I design something very nice, and then I give it to the developer and that's it. No, what, is this, what I design is what you have to develop is no longer uh, valid. So this is very much illustrated by this uh, very nice cartoon where you can see the designer here on the left saying, okay, look, this is a very nice prototype I produced uh, with exactly the good user interface that you have to uh, develop. And the developer uh, looking at him says, what? I'm not a monkey. Uh, if, if you have already done everything and uh, the prototype does exactly the behavior that is expected by the end user, so what should I, uh, what should I develop? But of course, a prototype is not a real system. Or a second example is now, uh, after being a monkey, the developer thinks that he's like Frankenstein because the, the, the designer said, now look, my prototype now is exactly with all the pixels, all the buttons, the style, the colors, the, the look and feel, that is the system that is uh, expected by the end user. And then the developer says, well, if you have done everything, I should not do anything. So this is no longer the case. Uh, here is also a, a very, uh, or a, an existing example from a, a company that I know, which is a software development company, which is not a good exemplification of uh, continuity. What they do, which is very nice, is that they perform iterative design, and each week they perform one version with specification and a prototype. So iteration or rolling, and they do that week after week, one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. But the problem of that is that when the customer is happy with that, the prototype is completely thrown, trashed. Then the, the prototype is just given in the, the hands of the developer and the developer has to start from scratch, poor guy. Instead, we are promoting continuity uh, between the steps, like first having very clear mockups, maybe add some more um, comments on specific elements, and then the UI flow for navigations and uh, interactive behavior, and then the final specification. Why? Because in the beginning here, all stakeholders can be involved, and in the end, only development is needed. And we go from the generic design to very specific design. So how to do that? Uh, so for that, we have developed a system called SketchXML, which enables you to develop systems from uh, a very low level of fidelity, just scribbling, sketching, drawing without any constraint. Then the system, when uh, at this stage, automatically recognize what I have sketched and go from low fidelity to medium to high fidelity and final look and feel. And this is just happening in a few seconds. So this is the system that performs that. And you, you have a, a cursor in order to switch from one level of fidelity to another. So here it is an example of how to perform continuity between those different levels. And here you can see a designer sketching uh, on a graphical tablet. Of course, here in this case is alone. So here is an example of the widgets that can be drawn and then recognized with your button, check boxes, list boxes, etc., and then the final look and feel. Of course, this, this final look and feel here is just an, an example. Um, in second, inclusion of end users. So a bad example is to give any interface builder in the hands of an end user. An end user is an excellent designer because, well, at least for himself or herself, but giving uh, a user interface builder is not a good idea because if the, the end user wants something like this, 
uh, with dynamic data, uh, et cetera. In the end, only this can be drawn with a user-face builder. And this is empty because this type of the behavior cannot be uh, realized by the end user. Um, however, with this software, so what we have tried to do is to give another editor in the hands of uh, an end user. So let me show you um, how it works. So this is the real system. So it's not a, just a user interface builder. It's like an Excel in which cell you can, of course, uh, copy paste uh, widgets. So this is a real system in which um, end users can already perform a very first sketch of their user interface. So let me show you uh, because, of course, time is running, uh, a, a small example. So here is an example of a form, uh, sorry, it's in, written in French, which has been done by an end user. So not a designer, not a developer, and of course, not a marketing person, the real end user. So you just drag and drop all of these things, and at any time you can test. Here it is automatically generated in Java. You can test the real user interface, like uh, you can select things, you can uh, change the user face. You can add uh, here are some dates. I'm just doing things randomly in order to illustrate the, the concept. Then you can add, add more, and you can go back. So here already you can uh, give this in the end of the end user. And without programming any line, the end user is able already to create some very first design. So, and when it is ready, the code that is automatically generated from this editor is automatically integrated in the project. Of course, if the end user is happy with that, and if this uh, version is, of course, uh, accepted by all of them. Interaction first. Uh, well, we all know that uh, usually we have um, in the three tier applications, we have the user interface the controller and the functional core of any interactive application. Okay, but in general, people can start with an horizontal prototype, which only covers the user interface without any dynamic behavior. So the nice thing is that it is very wide, but not very dynamic. On the other hand, a vertical prototype can say only a few parts of the system, but completely developed until the end. So the nice thing is that it is very dynamic. So it looks like a final system, but the scope is very narrow. The nice thing is that for agile methods, you can here delineate a very specific scenario that the design uh, and the development team can focus on. What we try to do in now so far is no longer this, but to have what I'm calling a diagonal prototype is that we first start with a first iteration on some cosmetic aspects, and then we progressively touch different functions with more and more functionalities. Of course, this is more easy to say than to do. Um, interaction first. Um, another example also here is another assistant that we have developed called Gambit. Um, a drawback of the system that you have seen here before um, like this one. So this, this software is a software that is used only uh, on a local machine. So of course, if the designer is close to the end user, fine, but on, only a few person can help him. Now we have developed a collaborative version of that, which is called Gambit, where users, designers, or any other stakeholder can be involved in the design life cycle. So again, the, the idea is the same. Any person can sketch any part of the user interface. So for instance, I can say, okay, you will be responsible for the homepage. You will design uh, the form. You will design the table. And people are working separately, independently, and they create screens, which are then gathered. And it can be even from paper. It is recognized from paper. And in the end, uh, they are automatically recognized and create a virtual prototype that can be sent by a new URL to real people. So here is an example of a real system that has been, well, a real prototype. Eh? It's 
there is no uh, code behind yet. And it has been tested in a steel uh, production uh, company. As you can see here, the, the user interface is, is already quite complex. And the nice thing is that the real end user can test it with the very right device exactly in the very right situation. So even without coding. And if they are, of course, we can, then the designer can refine that. And depending on that, they can, of course, refine the prototype. So anybody can sketch. You can sketch on your smartphone. You can sketch on a tabletop, because here you can see a designer who is very good in sketching, but on a white tabletop, while another user is looking at him and say, OK, I like to have this. I would like to have that feature, but not that one. So here, people are working collaboratively, but they can be also distributed in space. So these are the four configurations which can be supported. One person using a device or multiple devices, or several people using a single device or multiple devices. So here, um, since it can be used on any device, and you can test it, it's, you have the URL over here, you can test it if you like. Uh, any platform, provided that you have a web browser, can be used, even on a smartphone, a tablet, or whatever. So again, I said that the iteration should be short, but not fast. Because if it is short, it will be fast in some way, or at least effective. So for us, it's the, the iteration consists of four steps drawing or sketching, assembling all of the drawings coming from paper, from screens, from sketches into a single project that is supported by Gambit, prototyping, then sharing and testing so it can be displayed or it can be printed. Then people can discuss around the table or online, and then you can iterate as much as needed. Um, incremental progress. I would like now to uh, give an example with a last uh, demo. So this is the example of, of using sketching. So you can look at yourself. So here is an example of a more sophisticated system that we have developed recently, which is about uh, gesture interaction based on, you can see here, a lib motion in order to recognize hand gestures in order to manipulate multimedia objects, so pictures, documents, videos, etc. So by raising the hand, you can enter a catalog. You can browse in by swipe left, swipe right, point, rotate, left, right. You can zoom in, zoom out. You can move around. You can collect or you can create your own collection. You can like or dislike. Next picture, previous one. Come back to the collection or come back to the main menu. And you can do the, exactly the same now with videos, maps, documents, movies, volume down, volume up. Fast forward or rewind. OK, so as you can see in this example, um, so the, the gesture of interaction is very natural. And for, in order to obtain this system, we performed only three iterations. And but the iterations were very short. So we identify first four gestures. And a fifth one has been uh, added. And this one has been discarded because of the decision of the end user. Then we introduce a few more, and some more have been uh, discarded. So in three iterations, we finally get here in the end the final gesture set that you have seen uh, in the demo. So for, for this, uh, we have applied a, a pipeline software architecture, but I will not uh, develop that here for, for the moment. The very important aspect is that in order to accommodate quick changes, um, this module for uh, gesture acquisition, recognition, and application 
in, uh, integration application or configurable in a pipeline architecture. So not a set of modules. So the developers can configure these modules with parameters and change the order or their parameters without reprogramming everything. So in this case, in order to accommodate, let's say new functions or new gestures or even new device, it's a question of configuration. So in order to conclude, I, I try to illustrate how we addressed uh, my seven eyes. So again, uh, this is my main message and the seven eyes. And again, the most important of them is to ensure some continuity between the design and the programming uh, stages in the, the software development lifecycle. Again, uh, since I'm focusing on the end user, um, user interface, early inclusion as soon as possible is of course a must and interaction first. Why interaction first? Because uh, the rest can be, I would say, programmed or developed in a way that is very straightforward by the developer, provided that this first pass has been decided. So the other ones are not, not necessarily uh, less important, but usually I try to address them in this way. So in the end, if I'm looking at uh, the importance that I gave uh, to these uh, seven eyes, from a design operation point of view, the most important of them are those three first one. So this, this is why I put them on uh, location one, on position one, two, and three. Implementation continuity is also equally important for, uh, for developers. So this is a full boon. But inclusion of end user, as soon as uh, the design has been fixed, it is not so much important to have as many users involved in the development life cycle during development. Of course, the prototype should have, should have been validated beforehand. Integration uh, among stakeholders, I think is equally important throughout the whole development life cycle. Um, but of course, it's more important to have different types of stakeholders in the beginning than in the end. And regarding innovation uh, openness, I think it is not so much important from the design point of view. Although sometimes designers who are very creative, they are also integrating uh, new innovative aspects that are challenging to be integrated for, for developers. So this is why here it is more important for developers than maybe for uh, uh, designers. So here is my main message. So if you can keep this, uh, this three, pardon, these seven eyes in mind, and of course to try to prioritize them according to your project constraints, then I think this is uh, the, the key message that I want to, to convey. And I would be uh, very happy to, uh, to discuss them further uh, with you. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, okay, We have some time for questions, just uh, maybe five or maybe 10 minutes. Uh, we can start with the questions uh, from the attendees in the room. Meanwhile, um, Abel is configuring for the other virtual attendees. Is there any question in the room for John? So, John, maybe I can start with some questions for you. Uh, you mentioned that the ultimate goal for integrating design ops uh, with the vault is to reduce the time, uh, the time and to ensure the software quality. Uh, since we cannot prove the instability uh, of such systems, we can only collect evidence uh, that uh, the system is usable by means of usability, usability testing or enforce good uh, practices uh, and hope for the best. So I was wondering how can we determine whether 
the risk is acceptable. Uh, do you have any insights on, on that, uh, on, on this? Because for uh, safety critical systems, maybe you have to ensure that uh, the system, uh, the quality or the usability is not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me go back to one example that, that was done uh, here. Okay, let me show you the uh, screen. So let me go back to this screen. So the, in, in this example, um, uh, again, this is the, the full working prototype which has been created at design time. And uh, so we just gave the URL of the starting point to the real end users, which use them on site. And the system uh, on, on this graph that you can see here, the system records everything, what has been done. For instance, uh, which item has been selected in a menu, which item has been selected in a list box, what time, how much time did the user uh, spend uh, for each task or subtask? So even if it is not a real system, but a full working prototype, the systems recorded everything. So in this case, we can measure the efficiency, how much time did the user need to do that, the effectiveness, whether the end user was able to do that. So in this example, uh, the end user was uh, requested to monitor uh, several machines while moving to uh, it's a it's a steel production so it's a very long line so about 150 meters and uh, the person needs to go through all the lines and check a series of machines with a series of tests so um, uh, again just to let you know here we performed five iterations and in the end we have been able to show on, only on the prototype, huh? not on the final system, that the average time for completing this task has been reduced by 30%. The effectiveness has been increased from 75 to 95. And the satisfaction was measured externally by an IBM uh, CSUQ questionnaire, which was uh, performed online, but separately from the application. So this, although this graph may look like a big graph, all these transitions has been uh, measured by the system. So from one version to another, we have been able to monitor the progress, whether it was better, yes or no. Does this answer your question? Yeah, yes, I think so. Thank you, John. We have a um, question from the Okay. Uh, Oscar Pastor, I think uh, Oscar, you have the floor. Please go ahead. Uh, can you hear me, Silvia? Yes. yes. Okay, so Jan, very, very, very happy to, to hear to hear you. Let me first uh, congratulate all the organizing team for making it possible to dream that uh, normal life is more or less already coming back and making all the effort to organize uh, this conference. So thank you very much. Um, well, thank you very much, Jan, for the for for your fantastic talk. It's always a pleasure to know you, even if I'm doing that for many years. It's a sport that I like to practice to listen to you. <laughs> so, uh, well, I have just one <clears throat> one fast and general question. I think that you could, you you will guess the the direction of my question. That is basically in the sense that DevOps uh, seems to be for many authors. A last approach uh, where classical and widely accepted software engineering principles are put again together. So as you say, to take the best from the design step, uh, and this is the question as we are, you know, that we are working for years in the from the conceptual modeling perspective, this idea of, of taking the best from the design for, from the design step, step point of view should lead to make a conceptual model become a, a sort of key, art, key software artifact. What we know that is not historically the case. So I would like to know, uh, well, your point of view about this issue, the role of conceptual modeling to make true or to facilitate, to make uh, or to put into practice or to make real uh, these uh, seven eyes uh, that, uh, well, I think that this is a very interesting contribution that you put on the table. And you, you, are, you in your presentation, you have made, uh, you have provided some, some clues. For instance, the idea of having conceptual patterns 
of end user experiences in order to monitor them. And there are many things where conceptual modeling should, could or should play a key role. And this is this was my question. Thank you, thank you very much, Jan. Thank, thank you very much, Oscar, for uh, your appreciation and question. So in, in the last example, I've just shown you with the, uh, the, the, the prototype. I can, can you see me? Yes. Ah, OK. Um, in, in, in the last uh, prototype that I've shown you, so it was, there was no conceptual modeling at all, only from the user interface aspect. Mm. So that was working. So if we want to, instead of uh, creating those sketches and prototypes by hand, by the designers or the, the, the end user themselves, we can already create a very first version of that by automatically generating from the domain model, uh, from the conceptual model, a very first sketch of the user interface. So that is possible. And instead of um, having this, this step ensured by the designers along with the, the end user, this can be completely automated. The nice thing is that it creates already an iteration that is very short, but on the other hand, sometimes uh, end users don't want to do that because they want to, to do, to start, or at least to give the, to keep the illusion that they will create their own stuff for them instead of having already something for them. Mm -hmm. So it is very strange that in some case, uh, end users, I'm, I'm talking about end users and not designers or developers. Sometimes end users says, say, no, I don't want to have any input from any system. I want to create something new for me. But we, as we, we know that in principle, it is not exactly new, most of them most of the elements will be reused, but to give them the illusion that it will be a, a, a completely new system or maybe a, a, a creative approach, then we switch to the, uh, the prototyping part and we do not start from automatically generating a very first user interface for them by exploiting the domain model. Mm -hmm. The nice thing, again, I would like to emphasize that. Let me go back if you don't mind. Um, the very interesting part today, and this is very well illustrated in this, uh, in this part, let me go back again into this slide. Um, there it is, just a minute. Okay, I think I've shown you uh, this in this system, and we have been working with, with them for, uh, for doing so. Oh, no, not that one. Uh, So I think the most original part is this one. Uh, again, uh, you, you have seen here, uh, of course I can, in, in natural language, anybody, especially the end user, especially the end user can type uh, something and that the system already creates or suggests several layouts or interface prototypes uh, as an image. So this is not created from a series of patterns. The patterns are generated from the model. So here, there is a conceptual model of the user interface behind that interprets this natural language statement mm -hmm. and computes or generates some, uh, some possibilities for them. And in the end, if I go now in, in the end, uh, when the, the, the natural language is complete. Uh, orientation, for instance, should be uh, raw and flexible. Again, regenerate. So depending on these parameters, the system uh, exploit the conceptual model and only keeps now a few uh, preferred layout, which pretty much, I would say, match uh, the natural language statement and the image here. So it is not retrieved from a collection. So there are some other systems which retrieve those sketches or images from a database. This is not the case here. So I would say that the best part where the conceptual modeling is uh, very nice is to do that. And here it is, uh, again, the image 
or even the structure is automatically generated from the conceptual model. Mm -hmm. So this is, I would say today, my, my best example of where it can be uh, used effectively. But again, in order to give the illusion uh, to the, the, the people that we don't, uh, no, we, we, it's not that we start from scratch. They want to have a project that is specifically tailored to them. So we have to give them the illusion that we thought about everything for them specifically, not in general. I don't know if that question. Yes, thank you. Well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. And hope to meet face to face to continue discussing. Yeah, like very nice. Okay, thank you very much, Jan. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time for questions. I'm very sorry. But we do have another session uh, that will take place at 2.50 today. Right. It's chat with Jan, so then you can ask anything you want. So, uh, uh, with that, I would like to say thank you again uh, to Jan. My thank pleasure. You very much. Thank you.